Good evening. Here are yet again for another session of CENG 3325 Structural Analysis. All right, this is going to be the 23rd lecture in the video series, and today we are going to look at a long form example covering the force method for a beam of uh, a degree of indeterminacy of 2 or greater. So, in the previous examples, uh, let's, or previous discussions, previous lectures, so let's look at previous lectures. What have we covered in terms of the force method? Well, we have discovered uh, or discussed the uh, we have discussed the uh, theory behind the force method, and we have also looked at the uh, an example of dealing with the force method for beams for a single degree of indeterminacy, uh, single degree indeterminate structures, or at least beams. And so th this was useful, and when, again, if we remember our dis uh, past examples with the force method, we knew that we, uh, if we can recall that, we know that the basic method was to uh, look at a, we would have a primary structure or a primary beam, and a secondary beam dealing with one where the uh, redundant forces are moved. And that was simple enough when we had a uh, just one redundancy remove. We only had to relate one unknown force to one displacement. It was relatively simple. What I would like to do today is to work through a much longer form example uh, dealing with uh, a beam that has not one but two redundant forces and because of that does make the uh, math a bit more complex. So this is this is truly going to be a long form example so you might want to get yourself a snack. We're going to be here a while. Uh, and even if you want to uh, watch this and fast forward, it's still going to be a while. Anyway, let's get to this. So let us consider the following beam. This entire video is going to be working through one very long form example. So the following uh, form is given, or the following problem is given. We have a interesting beam, a continuous span beam, or a continuous beam. And it's going to be like this. On the left-hand side, I'm going to have three reactions because I'm going to have a fixed uh, support. And then I'm going to have two rollers. And the dimensions on this. Uh, each span, let's keep it simple enough, will be, let's say the left span has a, a, a length of 10 feet, and the right span also has a length of 10 feet. Then the loads on this. The initial load is going to start at zero, and it's going to linearly increase up to a uh, peak value on the right-hand side of three kips per foot. So linearly increase to three kips per foot. Oh, uh, it's a three kips per foot. Now, I just have to make this a little bit more interesting, uh, more than it already is. I know I've done quite a lot of beams of, uh, before. I've done, I know I've done quite a lot of examples of this in this course involving beams. And well, when I'm doing teaching steel design, I really have to do everything with steel. But just for fun, just for this particular problem, uh, because I've done so many problems involving steel beams, I thought I'd ha just uh, make it a little weirder and give a very interesting modulus elasticity. Instead of our friendly 29,000 KSI for steel, or our familiar 29,000 KSI for steel, we're going to use a really interesting one, and that is 58,000 KSI, and this is the modulus of elasticity of tungsten. So for some insane reason, we've decided to build a 20-foot long, uh, statically indeterminate tungsten beam. I don't know why we did this. I guess we were... Uh, really out of our minds at the time, and that would be incredibly expensive and hard to manufacture, but for whatever reason, we decided to manufacture a 20-foot long tungsten beam. And this thing has a moment of inertia, nothing too extraordinary here. A moment of inertia here of uh, 400 inches to the fourth power. So nothing too unusual about the moment of inertia, but it is kind of funny to have a giant beam out of tungsten. So this is given. So we know the dimensions, we know the geometry. Well, we don't know the cross-section, but we know the relevant geometry. Uh, we know the spans, we know the load, we know the modulus elasticity, we know the moment of inertia. We know all the important things, what we need to find. And uh, we want to find, the final thing we're looking for is the deflection um, at the middle of the right span. The deflection at the middle of the right span.
So in other words, what I would like to find out is I want to know the deflection right here. And as far as why I want that deflection, who knows, but I want it. So we're going to try to find it. So let's go and work through our method of uh, force or our force method, uh, listing all of our steps as we go. So the very first step is going to be to find the degree of indeterminacy. Now I kind of gave this away already, but let's go ahead and go through the process. So step one, uh, the very first thing you need to do is to find the degree of indeterminacy. The degree of indeterminacy of your beam. And this one's not going to be too bad. We have uh, one, two, three, and four, and five, the five reaction forces. And we, of course, because this is a single rigid body, the beam is not, there's no like moment release or anything like that in the middle. So this is one rigid body. So five minus three, this is two. This is indeterminate to the second degree. Uh, to the second degree. And the other thing you want to do in this first step, uh, choose redundance. Uh, choose redundant reactions. And we could do this any number of ways. Uh, let's see, first of all, well, maybe, again, just like with the last example, it might be tempting to choose the X force as the redundant or one of the redundants, but we can't do that because we don't really have any X loads or horizontal loads. So I could see a couple more, I could see two really convenient ways of doing this. Um, let's see, what could we do? Well, uh, removing, we could remove this one and then maybe the moment on the end, and then we'd have like a, a pin support here and a roller here with a cantilever. And that could be done, but that wouldn't really make the equations that convenient. Ideally, when you're using the force method, you're trying to remove a redundant that will make the calculations uh, or will collapse the beam into something that's one of our simpler uh, simpler beam forms that we'll find in a beam table. That's much more that's a much more convenient way of doing this. But of course, you can do anything you like. It just depends on how much time you want to spend doing calculations. So, uh, what else would be a good choice? Well, we could remove the moment reaction and then remove the middle. And if we did that, then we would have a simply supported beam. That would be one way of doing it. And if I hadn't already previously done one where I uh, where I had used a simply supported beam, I would do that. So for this one, I decided to have a little fun, and I am choosing, oh, in terms of my point names, I'm naming these in the rest of the problem, A, B, and C. I'm choosing to remove B and C, which will turn this into a full cantilevered beam. But again, there is no one absolutely correct way of doing this. If you do it right, you can choose almost anything, well, except for the horizontal force, I guess, but you can do whatever you want. Uh, it's just some are more convenient than others. So I'm going to choose uh, B and C. I choose uh, B, Y, and C, Y. And C, Y as my redundance, or as redundant forces. Again, these are the vertical reactions at B and C. So we have our redundant forces. We, figured out, we have figured out the number of redundant forces we need, and we have chosen them. Now, the second step is going to be to analyze the primary beam. To analyze the primary beam. And as a review, the primary beam is the uh, real beam, but with the, redundant for with the redundant reactions removed, but the real loads applied. Again, primary beam, you have your... Uh, Real loads, but redundance removed. Redundance removed. So if you have our, if we have our cantilevered beam here, and let's look at our forces here. Again, if you look at this past one, if we remove B and C, we are left with a simple cantilevered beam with a linearly, inclusive, linearly increasing load across it. And we're going to start at zero, and this is going to linearly increase up to uh, three kips per foot. However, I'm going to be a little bit more intelligent about this, and I'm just going to say, okay, well, that's three kips per foot, 
or uh, another way of expressing that is 0 0.25 kips per inch. I'm just going to go ahead and immediately convert this into inches. And I'm going to do this entire problem in terms of um, inch kips. Now, uh, we need to look at the deflected shape of this. This is going to be important. Uh, first of all, I guess I might list the dimensions. I might list the dimensions on here. And this thing is, well, I, need, I'm, I am going to need point B on here. So I'm just going to label this as 120 inches and 120 inches. And then I think I'll show the deflected shape. And maybe the deflected shape looks something, oh, I don't want quite something that steep. More like this. Okay. So the importance of this, if you remember from our previous discussions, we need to find the real deformations, or maybe not the real deformations, but the uh, deformations at the points where you remove the uh, redundant forces uh, or redundant reactions if the primary loads are still applied. So I need to find what I'm going to call this one here and this one here. Again, this is point C and point B. So this distance here is delta B naught or BO, and this distance here is delta CO. What delta BO and delta CO are as a, remu as, as a review, uh, delta BO is the uh, deflection that point B would have if the redundant forces were removed, or if the redundant, uh, if the redundant um, supports are removed. And delta CO is the, def the real deflection that joint C would experience if, again, the redundant supports are removed, the redundant reactions are removed. Okay, so we can do this a number of ways. And we might be able to find uh, some sort of, it's possible we might be able to find some sort of uh, beam table with this, but rather than digging through a bunch of beam tables and finding one with a, um, tri uh, a, uh, a uh, cantilever beam with triangular load, that would be a fairly rare one, but uh, I could probably find one digging online. But I decided just to go ahead and solve this one by integration. This one is a relatively simple. It's a cantilever beam. Or it's, it was a relatively simple problem. It's a cantilever beam. Uh, zero deflection and rotation in the end. Relatively simple to solve by integration. And a nice, simple uh, load function as well. So I'm just going to go ahead and run through that. Uh, w of x, first of all. And if you remember, if you're having any trouble remembering uh, how to solve for... Um, deflection via integration, feel free to see some of my earlier videos in this video series, uh, solving for shear and bending moment and deflection via integration. So W as a function of x, uh, first of all, I want to say 0 0.25 divided by 240. That's, 200, that's 0.25 kips per inch divided by the total length that increases by of 240 inches, and so we have a slope in exact form of 100, one, or sorry, 1 over 960 x. So our load function, w of x is 1 over 960x. Then I can get the shear. v as a function of x is going to be the negative integral of w of x dx. And I'm going to move through this fairly quickly again because uh, by this point in the semester, finding deflection by integration should hopefully be, be fairly intuitive to y'all. So uh, if I do the negative integral of this, I will get negative 1 over uh, 960 here. Uh, negative 1 over 960x plus c1. Now, uh, I do, to get the c1 and the m, I suppose, to get my, the constants for both my shear and my moment, I do need to solve for the reactions here. And if you go do, uh, go find the area under this curve, just one half base times height, you will find that point A has a vertical reaction force of 30 kips. So on the left-hand side of the beam, we have a vertical reaction of 30 kips. And then if you do a, a sum of moments across the beam, uh, 30 kips times uh, two-thirds of the distance across, you will find that this has a reaction moment of 4,800 kips. Or sorry, 4,800 kip inches per moment. Again, I am going to try to do this entire problem with uh, inches and kips, just avoiding any unit conversions. So next, I want to try to find a, uh, I got to find my constant C1. And my constant, or my boundary condition, 
my boundary condition, because I know the vertical force on the right is 30 kips, the vertical reaction on the right is 30 kips, I know that the shear on the right-hand side is also going to be 30 kips. So the boundary condition is that V at x equals 0 is equal to 30. So therefore, C1 is equal to 30 kips. C1 is equal to 30 kips. And uh, so then my V as a function of x will be equal to negative 1 over 960 uh, plus x plus 30. Uh, negative 1 over 960 x plus 30. Then uh, my moment, I can get my m as a function of x, my moment as a function of x. This is going to be equal to my the integral of my shear function, integral of v as a function of x, and uh, that will equal, uh, if I take the integral of that, that's just going to equal 30x minus uh, x squared over 1920. But of course I can't forget my constant integration, and I'm going to call that c2 then a boundary condition. Well, boundary condition, now it might be tempting to say that the moment on the left-hand side is 4800. We actually know that it's going to be opposite of that, and uh, again, because of our, um, our relationship between internal and external moment, as we have discussed many times before, and the boundary condition is that at m at x equals 0, is uh, not going to be positive 38 uh, not, not is not going to be positive 4800 but negative 4800 kip inches negative 4800 kip inches so negative 4800 kip inches all right so that means moment as a function of x m as a function of x here and we're still in step 2 the analyzing the primary beam m as a function of x is equal to 30x minus x squared over 1920 uh, minus 4,800. Next, I want to go and find theta as a function of x. And uh, this is equal to 1 over ei. Uh, 1 over ei times the integral of m of x dx. And if you go ahead and run through the integral of the moment function, you will get that this is negative x cubed over 5,760. Uh, over 5,760, uh, let's see, plus 15x squared, minus 4,800x, minus 4,800x, uh, plus c3, and then times 1 over ei, all times 1 over ei. Basically, I just extracted the 1 over ei as a constant but not the same as the constant in here. Again, minus 4800x plus c3. Then, uh, thankfully, the boundary condition on this is fairly simple. And the boundary condition, because there is a fixed support on the left-hand side of the beam, v theta at x equals 0 is going to be equal to 0. So therefore, that leads us to, since theta is a function of x is equal to all this nonsense, that means that c3 is equal to 0. So theta then, as a function of x, is equal to uh, 1 over ei times negative x to the third over 5,760 plus 15x squared minus 4,800x. Minus four, and again, minus 4,800x. Then y as a function of x is equal to the integral of theta of x dx. And this is equal to, if we run through this integral, this will be equal to negative x to the fourth uh, divided by 23,040. We should probably stop using the exact forms pretty soon. Uh, 23,040. Uh, let's see, plus 5x to the third, and then minus 2,400. Let me clean that up again a bit. Minus, or plus 5x to the third minus 2400x squared, oh, plus a c4, plus our fourth constant. And thankfully, again, our boundary condition is relatively simple. And the boundary condition is uh, that y at x equals 0 is also equal to 0. There is no deflection, again, because there is a cantilever on the left hand side, because we have a fixed support on the left hand side of the beam. So that means there is no, uh, there is no deflection at the left-hand side of the beam, so that is equal to zero. 
and that leads us to C4 being equal to zero. So finally, we actually do manage to have our uh, y as a function of x for the primary beam. We have a final y as a function of x is equal to negative x to the fourth uh, divided by 23,040, 23,040 plus 5x to the third minus 2,400x squared. Minus 2,400x squared. So again, this still though is dealing with the primary beam. This is the beam with the redundant supports removed and we want to find how much uh, joints B and C would deflect without those redundant supports present. And once we have the entire deflection equation for our cantilever beam, it's relatively straightforward. We can just plug and shut at this point. So delta BO, delta BO is going to be equal to Y of 120 inches. And if you substitute 120 inches into this expression here, uh, and actually I might even do that on this slide here because I don't see the need to necessarily plug and chug and work all the way through that. Uh, y, uh, delta B naught, is going to be equal to Y of uh, 120 inches. And that will be equal to then uh, simply, uh, I when I did that, I got negative 1.118 inches. Negative 1.118 inches. And again, all I did was put 120 into this equation here, and I got negative 1.118 inches. Then delta C naught, that is just equal to y of 240 inches. And when I did that, I got, uh, let's see, negative 2.986 inches. 2.986 inches. Yeah, that would be better confined to this slide. Okay, so now we actually have our uh, deformations uh, at, on joints B and C, or I, sh I shouldn't say joints, there's really no joints there. Well, I guess, eh, from the point of view supports, I guess you could do this as joints. But anyway, I now have the deformations at point B and point C if those reactions were not present. Okay, so next I want to analyze the secondary beams. I'm gonna call that step three. Analyze the secondary beams. And notice, I did not say analyze the secondary beam, I said analyze the secondary beams, plural. That is not an accident. Analyze the secondary beams. All right, so let me show you what the secondary beams would lo look like. Well, I'm gonna have uh, two different secondary beams. The first, I'm gonna have one secondary beam with a unit load at point B, and, one, and another secondary beam with a unit load at C. And so every time you remove a reaction, uh, you're gonna have a secondary beam with a unit load there. And if you removed a, now for our, because we move, because we removed pin supports, uh, sorry, or roller supports, uh, what we were really removing was a redundant vertical reaction. So that's just one single point load. If I had chosen to remove the moment, I'd be applying a unit couple to that beam. So uh, then I'd be, I'd have a couple rather than a point load, but anyway. So let's analyze secondary beams. And the first one I'm going to look at is the, uh, the beam with a unit load at point B. So I have points A, B, and C. Points A, B, and C. And I'm going to apply a unit load at point B. And because we're using units of kips and KSI and inches of the fourth, etc., my unit load is going to be one kip. Again, if you're in a different country or using a different unit system or whatever your local unit system might be, well, if you're not in the United States, it's probably metric. Um, we have uh, special American freedom units here. So uh, we use pounds and kips, etc., etc. Uh, but if you're elsewhere, uh, you'd want to use, uh, well, if your unit was, uh, if you were doing dealing with stresses or module, if your module elasticity was in megapascals, I'd be probably apply a one a mega newton load or something like that. You just have to make sure to match whatever units your uh, module elasticity mainly is in. Uh, but if all else fails, you can always just convert to base metric units. Like uh, if I was doing a problem in metric, I'd just I'd probably just take the lazy way out and just convert everything to uh, pascals and newtons and, and meters and just take the lazy way out and just use base units for everything. That is the one nice thing about the metric system. It's very easy to just convert to base units. No dividing by 12 and all that. 
but we're using freedom units here. <laughs> Good old American freedom units. So, uh, <laughs> freedom units. Oh boy. Um, so, we have a uh, dimension here of 120 inches and 120 inches. And then let's do our deflected shape. <laughs> And our deflected shape here is actually going to be upward, like this. Now, here's where it gets fun. Because do you remember our, or remember from the previous video, or the previous video is perhaps plural, we have a very interesting naming convention here. I'm gonna call this one lowercase delta because we're dealing with a, a load from a virtual, uh, or displacement from a virtual load rather than from a real load. And so I'm gonna say delta BB, and then a delta CB. Let's review what these are. Delta BB. This is the deflection at B. Uh, from a unit load, uh, from a unit load at B. Delta, uh, then delta CB. This is a deflection at C from a unit load at B. Or maybe I should say applied at B. And delta CB is the deflection at C from a unit load applied at B. From a unit load applied at C, or sorry, applied at B. And we're going to see later on, uh, actually very shortly here, that uh, there's a reason we're using this kind of dual subscript system. And the reason for that is, uh, in this problem, we're going to have both a delta CB and a delta BC, and they're not going to be the same thing. Delta CB is going to be a deflection at C from a unit load applied at B, while delta BC is going to be the deflection at B from a unit load applied at C. So now this can be very confusing, but it it's, it does take it. I know it. And for, the thing about the force method, the, um, once you get it, it works really well. But it's something that does take quite a bit of time for you to really wrap your brain around. It's one of those things that you just have to chew on for a while mentally before you really get it. So uh, let's go ahead and analyze the secondary beam. Now. Uh, to get these, this is something that I can solve thankfully with beam tables. This is a uh, this is a uh, a beam. It has a uh, a single point load applied at it. This is the kind of thing that I would very easily apply at a beam uh, at find in a beam table. And so I went to a beam table. List of um, when I say a beam table, what I'm referring to again is a table uh, you can find in the steel manual or many. I actually found it in an old structural analysis text of mine. Um, or you can find it in real or online or Wikipedia. You can probably find it in Wikipedia. Um, anywhere really. Just a lister, a listing, a lister, wow. Just a listing of various uh, um, formulas for uh, bending moment shear, deflection, rotation, etc. So the formulas I found and then going ahead and applying them delta BB, uh, again from beam tables. The nice thing about these redundant loads is that they're usually very easy to analyze. Or from beam tables here. I found the equation uh, delta BB is equal to negative uh, 1 kip uh, times, or divided by, 6 EI, 6 times 58,000. Uh, 58,000 here. 6 times 58,000 here. Oh, let's see then. Um, 58,000. Uh, and let's see here. Oh, actually something I forgot to mention here. Backing up. Uh, if you're having trouble with this stuff, I probably should mention uh, there is an EI here. I just noticed that. Sorry about that. There is an E, 1 over EI here. I forgot to write that. Uh, y as a function of x. equals 1 over EI here. So that is kind of important. If you don't have that, you may be having a slight issue with calculating those deflections. Or quite a large issue, depending. 
So there'll be a one over EI there, and uh, you can't get that. You can't get these deflection values or any, even anything remotely close unless you put in one over 58,000 divided by, and your uh, one over 58,000 times 400. So make sure you have those in your uh, calculation. Hopefully that was really uh, obvious, but uh, as you can see, I maybe forgot to write that in there. Okay, so 58,000 times 400. Uh, and then times, let's see, 120. Uh, 120 to the third power minus 3 times 120 uh, times 120 squared. Uh, and that came to uh, that came to 0 0.02483 inches. 0 0.02483 inches. And then when I did delta CB, oh, I had a formula, negative 1 kip, let's see, negative 1 kip, uh, times 120 squared, divided by 6 times 58,000, uh, times 400, and this came to 120. These are just basically the lengths, and uh, basically these formulas use a combination of things. They use the length of the beam, they use the position of the load, and they use the point where I want to find the deflection. And 120 minus 3 times 240. But you could use any method of your choosing. You could actually solve this one by integration if you wanted to as well. But uh, I got uh, this then equals 0 0.06207 inches. Again, I hope you're not getting too hung up on this. Uh, if you, to find these deflections is nothing uh, magical. All this is is just treat it like a beam with a point load on it. How do I find the deflection? Statically, it's statically determinant. Apply any method of your choosing, whether integration, you could use virtual work, you could use any method really, just whatever you want to do to find the deflection at point B and C if there is a one kip load applied at B. I know I kind of, uh, kind of danced through that one fairly quickly, um, but it is hopefully fairly straightforward. Uh, there. And let's see, did I get that? 658,400, just checking my notes here. And negative one kip, 120 squared. Okay, there you go. Uh, then I want to analyze the secondary or the second secondary beam, and that one is going to be where there is a unit load applied at C. Uh, maybe I'll write it a little bit lower so I can show the deflected shape. So again, we have a fixed support or a cantilevered beam, and uh, I'm going to have a one kip load this time applied at joint C. And this is a one kip load. And then our deflected shape will be upward like this. Like this. And then we have points A, B, and C again. A, B, and C. With dimensions 120 inches and 120 inches. And let me go ahead and label some points here, or some uh, distances. This is going to be delta BC. See, this is the deflection at point B caused by a unit load at C. Again, a deflection at point B caused by a unit load at C. So I'm applying a unit load at C, the beam bends upward like this, and then we can see what kind of deflection it's going to have there. And then this would be delta CC. This is the deflection at joint C due to a unit load applied at, at joint C. And again, I tend to use the, uh, the lowercase delta in cases where I'm dealing with a deflection from a virtual load. Or a virtual unit load. And I don't see a need to work through the calculations here. Let me just say, uh, for the sake of brevity, that when I ran through and got these things, again, just applying equations for cantilever beams, uh, with a unit load, or just not a unit load, just any load on them, deflection, etc. I got that the deflection BC was equal to 0 0.04966 inches, and that delta CC was equal to 0 0.19862 inches. 19862 inches. So if I have a unit load at B, at point, sorry, if I have a unit load at point C, I joint B is going to move upward by 0.05 inches-ish, 
and joint C is going to move up by about 0.2 inches. Okay, so let's go ahead and summarize these. And I'm actually going to purposely rewrite the order because I want to look at how we're going to apl actually apply these in equations. Uh, delta BB is equal to 0 0.02483 inches. Uh, 2483 inches. Uh, delta BC is equal to 0 0.04966 inches. 4966 inches. Delta CB is equal to 0 0.06207 inches. And Delta CC is equal to 0 0.19862 inches. And the reason I'm grouped these together is because when we actually put these into equations, we're going to put the joint C deflect or the joint B deflections with the joint B deflections and the joint C deflections with the joint C deflections. So as a review, let me just review what these things are. Uh, delta BB, just to make sure we're absolutely clear on what this is. And again, sorry if this is uh, belaboring the point. Delta BB is the deflection at B from a unit load at B. Deflection at B from unit load at B. Uh, delta, let's see, delta BC, let me just go ahead and write all of them here. Deflection BC, deflection uh, CB, and deflection CC. Well, this is the deflection at B uh, from unit load at C. Uh, from unit load at C, delta CB is the deflection at C from units load, that looks like bowed or something, uh, unit load at B. Oh, my terrible handwriting, nothing new here. Uh, delta CC is the deflection at C from units load at C. So now we hopefully are very clear on what each of these things means. So step four is going to be to apply equations of compatibility, or what I might call balance the deflections. So apply compatibility or balance the deflections. Or balance deflections. So what does this mean? As a review again, what does this mean? Well, Without these reactions present, without the reactions at B and C, the load here, our uh, triangular load, would cause this thing to bend down a certain distance. If I were to apply a load at B, it would cause it to bend upward a bit. And if I were to apply a load at C, it would also come. It would also cause this to bend upward a bit. And because we agree, uh, believe in linear superposition, as long as this is everything's linearly elastic, as long as we can just add the stresses together. Um, Basically, what we can say is that the combined effects of these must be to bring the overall deflection back to zero. So, in other words, the uh, the tendency to bend at from loads at B and C must be equal and opposite from the tendency to bend from the actual uh, downward load applied on, this, on the beam. So, I need to apply a compatibility of deflections. So, and I'm going to apply this. Well, I suppose you could use it in almost any point you want, but I'm going to apply this at location where uh, the supports are. Actually, no, you, sorry, you cannot do this at whatever you want. You have to do this at the locations where the supports are removed because the ultimate goal of this is to find your uh, is ultimately to find your displacement forces. Oh wait, uh, well, actually, wait, let me think about that because um, I have to think. I'd have to think about that some more because. Um, and actually, because it's all based on like uh, delta BC is, is in terms of uh, from C, I suppose you actually could use deflections almost anywhere, but uh, you'd have to, I mean, we could solve mid-span for everything or something like that, but, but no. Okay, I still keep, keep going back and forth in my thoughts. Uh, no, you actually do have to use the support, the locations B and C, and the reason for this is because we actually, these are the few points where we actually factually know the deflections. 
we know the deflection here and here is zero. So that's something we, like, in order to set one of these equations up, we have to know the final answer. And because these are actually roller supports and from the original problem, uh, before I do anything else, before I figured anything out at all, before I, put a fin before I put a single mark down on the page or a single thing in my calculator, I already know the deflection here and here is zero. So without that knowledge, I can't solve for this. I, I can't use this as a, a place to set up a good equation. So I couldn't, I can't really use midspan or something like that. Okay. I was just sort of thinking through my head, like, wait, could we use another point if we wanted to? Would that even mathematically work? And the answer is no, we have to use points B and C or the points where you remove your redundance from. And because those are, because those are points where we know the deflection. And the same thing would apply if you were removing rotations, for example. So apply compatibility and balance def uh, deflections. And again, we'll, uh, we'll look at, we'll analyze deformation, analyze total deformation. At location, or at locations where, oh, where, uh, let's see, uh, boundary conditions or uh, supports are removed, reactions are removed, or redundant reactions are removed. Where redundant reactions were removed. Okay, so first of all, I'm going to look at B. And I'm going to have delta B O or delta B naught. That is the real deformation from the real loads at point B. Not the loads at B, but the uh, the triangular load, the real loads on the structure. It produces a certain deformation at B, which we've already, already calculated. Plus lowercase delta B B times B Y times B Y uh, plus lowercase delta B C times CY equals zero. Remember, delta BB basically says how much will joint B deflect upward if there's a one kip load applied at joint B, at point uh, B. And so if I look at the real reactions, well, if this is, say, 10 kips, then the, uh, because that's 10 times higher than the, uh, than the one kip load, this would make this 10 times higher. Again, we're assuming a linear relationship between load and deflection. Uh, and same thing here, this would say if we, if, uh, we looked at the, we, this, this delta BC tells you how much, uh, how much uh, point B would move if there's a one kip load at, on joint C. So to get the real deflection upward, we could just multiply whatever CY happens to be, and that would balance things out. So then um, I, if I put these in, I can get negative 1.118. Uh, oh, actually also, let me get my at C, let's set that up. Uh, delta C naught plus uh, delta CB, it's the same kind of thing. This is the, uh, and that would be times BY, uh, C times tell it CB, I don't know if I can manage to write a B properly, times uh, BY plus delta CC times CY, and this all equals zero. Again, this is the, uh, the, the deformation at joint C caused by a unit load at B, so I can just multiply that by the magnitude of the, of the actual reaction to get the overall displacement and same idea here. So now it's just plugging and chugging. So if I move this one down, putting in known values, negative 1.118 inches uh, plus 0 0.02483 by, 0.02483 by plus, uh, oh, I can manage to not jump ahead. Uh, 0.02483by plus 0.049666cy equals zero, and negative 2.986 uh, inches uh, plus 0 0.06207. Again, all I'm doing is plugging and chugging at this point. 06207 times by uh, plus 0. Point, that looks like that's a really bad cy 
uh, plus 0 0.19862 Cy equals 0. And now we just have two linear equations with both by and cy as unknowns. We have two equations, we have two unknowns. Uh, you can solve this for whatever method you please. Uh, you could solve it by a substitution, but uh, looking at this, when, these num when the numbers are this ugly, I think the most convenient way is just to use a matrix anyway. So I did that, and I won't, I won't run through the whole matrix math. I think at this point, I know he, I think you can solve a 2 by 2 matrix. And so uh, I got that by is equal to uh, 39.875 kips. And that CY is equal to 2.570 kips. CY is equal to 2.570 kips. So now we have our reactions at the redundant supports. And now we basically have a statically determinate beam. We now essentially just have a normal statically determinate beam. All right. So let's keep working through this. To the, uh, let's see. That's going to be the fifth step. Let me double check something here. No, nope, we're looking good. So next I want to look at the, uh, next I want to look at the, uh, this, at the uh, statically determined system. All right, so now we're gonna look at the fifth step and the final step, which is just simply analyze this as you would any statically determinate beam. So five, uh, analyze the now statically determinate beam. Now a statically determinate beam. And with our redundant uh, reactions removed or our redundant supports removed, this is what our beam then becomes. This is what our beam then becomes. I would have my same linear load, that's not going to go away, with, uh, let's see, 3 kips per foot, or 0 0.25 kips per inch, 0 0.25 kips per inch, then at point B, I'm going to have a 39.875 kip reaction and then a 2.570 kip reaction at C. So interesting how much greater the midspan was, the B1 was, even though we had a, a, a linearly increasing load. And I did, I thought that was a little odd at first, but uh, sometimes that can work out a little oddly just depending how the beam uh, stiffness and curvature works out. And so we have 10 feet here and 10 feet here, or I sh as I should probably write this, 120 inches and 120 inches. 120 inches and 120 inches. So uh, now at this point, we're essentially trying to solve for whatever the problem uh, asked us to solve or whatever we happen to be interested in uh, for our design. And if we're a design engineer, whatever we happen to be interested in. So we were asked uh, to find the deflection in the middle of the right span. Uh, we were asked to find the deflection in the middle of the right span. So let's go ahead and do that. Define deflection in the middle of the right span. Again, deflection in the middle of the right span. So let's go ahead and do that. And I'm going to go ahead and do that by integration. Uh, solve by integration. So I'm going to, I'm going to run through this relatively quickly. Uh, w of x is the same W of x as before. That's not going to change. W of x is going to be equal to 1 over 960x. 1 over 960x. No change there then v as a function of x is equal to negative x squared over 1920 plus c2, or I should probably call this c1. Different c1 than last time though, different c1 than last time though. So our equations are gonna be a little reminiscent of each other, but they're not gonna be the same equations. They're gonna be like, it's almost like they rhyme, but they're not exactly the same equations because of the different boundary conditions, etc. 
because again, when we were previously solving this, we were dealing with a, a cantilever beam without any loads in the middle here. So what I think I'm going to do is I'm going to apply a boundary condition that, uh, let's see, well, I do know one boundary condition, and that is that at, uh, if you think of how shear and bending mode diagrams work, at the end, at basically at the end of a shear and bending mode diagram, if you have an upward load, that's going to cause the shear, and then, uh, the shear diagram, if this is your zero line on your V, for example, if that's your V, whatever that might be, uh, if there's an upward load at the end, it's going to cause the uh, shear diagram to jump back up. So that means that I have a boundary condition that V, uh, boundary condition that V at X equals 240, in other words, the end of the beam is equal to, is going to be equal to, uh, let's see, that's going to be equal to, uh, let's see, what was that? That was 2.570 kips. Or sorry, negative 2.570 kips. Again, because this point load on the end of the beam is going to cause it to jump back up, is going to cause it to jump to 2.570 kips, and the free end must end up at zero, and the only way that can end up is at the min, at the millisecond before or millimeter before that point 2.570 load is applied, that our shear is at negative 2.570. So, if you put 240 in for x and uh, for x and negative 2.570 in for v, uh, when I did that, I got that c1 was equal to uh, let's see, that was 24. Uh, 0.4297. And I'm just going to do the rest of these as uh, decimals rather than uh, exact form. So that gives me a shear as a function of x. That gives me a shear as a function of x of, uh, and I'm going to go, just going to go ahead and start working all of this as decimals. So we're going to have some nice ugly decimals, actually really ugly decimals as we get further along. Uh, we're going to have to go to scientific notation pretty soon. Negative 0.00. .00 uh, 521 x squared, uh, 521 x squared, uh, plus, 521 x squared, plus 27.4297. 0 0.4297. Then if you go ahead and integrate this, m as a function of x is going to be equal to uh, the integral of shear as a function of x, no great surprise there. And this will come to uh, 27, uh, let's see, that will be, what does that come to? 27.4297 uh, x minus 0 0.0001740, 1740, uh, let's see, x to the third plus c2 x to the third plus c2. Now, I do need a boundary condition, and this one's relatively simple. I know that the moment on a free end of a beam must be equal to zero. So it's, it's a, this is a, again, if I'm analyzing this as a cantilever, or if I wanted to consider it with the uh, the actual real roller support that was there, the, uh, the, the moment there must be equal to zero. Either one. So the moment uh, not at x equals 0, but at x equals 240 inches must be equal to 0. So if I put in a 0 in for here and 240 in for x into these two expressions here, oh, and there should be an x squared. Sorry about that. 27.4297x squared minus 0 0.000174x to the third plus c2. If you put a 0 in for m of x here and 240 in for x, what I found was that c2 was equal to a lovely number of negative 4,183.13 kip inches. 0.13 kip inches. Then I want to go ahead and get theta as a function of x. Theta, is, theta as a function of x is equal to 1 over ei times the integral of m of x dx. Uh, integral of 1 over, M, 1 over ei times m of x dx, and I then got negative 3.7, actually that's the next one, sorry about that. Um, okay, so let me just go ahead and uh, work through this. I do think I'm going to work through this one because this is kind of interesting. So I'm going to go, I am going to go ahead and work through this one. 
All right, so let's see. So integral of m of x dx. And this is going to be then 1 over 58,000. Again, this is going to be a bit of a review from our earlier look at uh, deflection. A deflection by integration. 58,000 times 400. And if we go ahead and uh, put the integral of that, uh, times the integral of 27.4297x minus x minus 0.000174x to the third. Uh, 174x to the third minus, uh, now I'm going to use some uh, powers of 10, some e's, actually not quite yet, minus, sorry about that, that would be minus 4,183, if I can manage to try to pour it properly, 4,183.13. 183.13 dx. And uh, that's going to give us then, and I'm just going to, because I've included the EI now, I'm just going to use some scientific notation. This is equal to negative 1.871 uh, e to the negative 12. So the negative 12, or not negative 17, negative 12, x to the fourth plus 5.9. 1, 2, e to the negative 7, e to the negative 7, uh, x squared, uh, x squared, and then minus 1.803, e, again, or times 10 to the negative, e to the negative 5, uh, x, actually, sorry, e to the negative 4, x, e to the negative 4, x. So, Negative 1.871 uh, e, not to be confused with modulus plasticity, that's your exponential e, capital E, e to the negative 12 times x to the fourth plus 5.912 e to the negative 7 x squared minus 1.803 e to the negative 4 x. Um, and maybe I could put a couple parentheses around these to make clear that these are just coefficients, really ugly coefficients, but just coefficients nonetheless. And then plus c3. Now the trouble with this is looking at our beam here. In this region, uh, I don't have any uh, boundary conditions that I can use. I don't have any boundary conditions that I can use for theta because I don't know the rotation either here or here because it is not a fixed support. So I'm just gonna have to leave that as C3 and come back and solve it when, I have, um, when I've worked through my deflection. Then y as a function of x is equal to the integral of theta of x dx theta of x dx, and when you run through that integral, you will get uh, something like, uh, let me put here, negative 3.742 e to the negative 13 times x to the fifth plus uh, one point, that's going to be 1.917, or 971, e to the negative 7, e to the negative 7, uh, x to the third minus uh, 9.02 e to the negative 5 e to the negative 5 uh, x squared x squared plus c3x plus c4. So now I have two constants that I don't know, but uh, thankfully I do have boundary conditions that I can use. And this is where the, the this is where our uh, redundancy will actually come back, in that even though I have replaced these with forces, I know in reality the real deformation here and here will be zero, or the real deflection. I shouldn't say deformation because deformation includes rotation, uh, but I do know that, the, know that the deflection here and here is going to be equal to zero. So those can be my boundary conditions. So then using my boundary conditions, um, let's see, can I squeeze in here? Probably. Boundary conditions. Uh, here, if I apply the equation y equals, uh, or y at x equals 120, uh, point that, or the, not the equation, but the fact that y at x equals 20 equals 0 into this, that's, that is the coordinate of point B, and I put 0 in for y and 0, or sorry, 0 in for y and 120 in for x, this all collapses to the form of, uh, that collapses to the form of 120 c3 
plus C4 equals, when I move the constant uh, here, I'll move all this will collapse to one number, and I'll move to the right-hand side, I'll get 0 0.9670. Again, basically all of this comes to negative 0.9670, but then I move it to the right-hand side to get, a, to get an equation that I can work with. And 120 is the x, that's the 120 here, and C4 remains unchanged. Then, for my next boundary condition, uh, I can use y of x equals 240 is also equal to 0. And when I put 240 in for x and 0 in for y, this collapses to the equation uh, C3. Uh, this collapses to the equation that 240 C3 uh, is equal to uh, 240 C3 uh, plus C4 is equal to 2.767 equal to 2.767. So I, when I combine that with the equation I had previously, 120C3, uh, 123 plus uh, C4 is equal to 0 0.9670. 0 0.9670. I have two equations to a known, so I can solve those. And I use a matrix, but you can use whatever method you like. And I got that C3 is equal to 0, 0.0. Uh, one or 0 0.0500 and C4 is equal to negative 0 0.833. And so my final deflection in this equation, my final deflection equation, and this would be valid in the second span because I use boundary conditions from the second span, would, what was that, neg, uh, that y as a function of x is equal to negative 3.742 e to the negative uh, e to the negative 13 times x to the fifth plus 1.971 e to the negative, uh, let's see, 7 times x to the third minus 9.02 e to the negative 5 e to the negative 5 x squared plus uh, 0 0.015 x, 0.150 x uh, minus 0 0.833. And that is my final deflection equation. And then finding the deflection at mid-span on the right hand, uh, on the right span. Well, all I'm doing there is finding, is plugging in 180 inches into this, because that's the x-coordinate from the left-hand side of the, measure from the left-hand side of the mid-span. And when I put 180 into this beast of an equation, I got that this is equal to 0 0.0244 inches. So the deflection there is equal to 0 0.0244 inches. Whew. So, and that is it. That is the entire problem, working through the whole thing. I did, uh, I did simplify a few steps working through this. Now, a couple notes on this. As you can imagine, this is a quite uh, mathematically and labor-intensive process. Uh, this kind of thing is probably best done by algebraic software, whether you're using an a integral solver or you could use a problem. Pro actually, a program like Maple would work really well, maybe MATLAB in certain, MATLAB in certain cases, especially for the more numeric side of things. Uh, this is something that can cause a lot of trouble or can be very difficult, and especially because if you make one mistake along the way, well, it's all, it's all in line. A leads to B leads to C leads to D, and you do have to be very careful to check your work. So. This here, I'm pretty sure that's the right answer. This is definitely the right method. It is possible. I mean, I did put this one together myself today, so it's certainly possible that there's some minor mistake in here that halfway through the middle it makes all this wrong, uh, or at least makes all the numbers wrong, but the general method is correct. So I mean, there may be some typo in here somewhere, some fat finger on a calculator that made one of these numbers wrong, but the general method is correct. So if I had more time, I'd probably run through and check and double check and triple check all the numbers. But this is meant to be a brief uh, example of how to work through our uh, uh, through the force method using uh, or for uh, beams with a degree of determinacy two or greater. And if we had uh, more than three redundants or more than two redundants, you could do this the exact same way. All you would be doing is simply uh, putting another beam together and each of your uh, each of your equations of deflection here would have, like if you had a point D here, you'd have uh, you'd have a corresponding D term here, a corresponding DY term here, a corresponding DY term here, and in each case, 
uh, for every redundant, you're going to add another term to each of your equations and another equation also to the set. And past two, you'll definitely want to use a matrix, but hopefully that's not too bad. All right, that'll do it for, t for today. Thank you for watching. Let me know if you have any questions. Hope you all found this a little bit illuminating. Hope you all uh, enjoyed this a little bit, besides from the uh, hour-long tedious math problem. But uh, hopefully it's not too bad. And, and be sure to let me know if you have any questions. All right, that'll do it for today. Thank you, as, uh, thank you for watching. And as always, thank you.